from Centurion Group DC. This is Political Compliance News with your host, Mark Callahan. And we're glad to have everyone with us today. As we had mentioned in our last broadcast, we would have a special guest with us to talk about the effects of the recent Supreme Court ruling of McCutcheon versus the Federal Election Commission. Most folks already know that the major change in the rules was the elimination of the federal aggregate contribution limits, but there is a lot more to this rule. And we've asked our special guest today, Melissa Lorenza, a senior political law counsel of Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Howard, and Feld, to join us and share some perspective on that. Melissa, thanks so much for taking time out uh, this afternoon to be with us. We can't, we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. You know, so, of course, the, the first question becomes is when does this ruling take effect? Well, essentially what the FEC has said is that they are going to be taking a look at their regulations. This opinion was actually issued on April 2nd and the FEC issued an opinion later that same day saying, well, we're going to take a look at our regulations and see how this decision is going to impact them. However, the court has basically said the aggregate limits are unconstitutional and are invalid. So the FEC would not be able to enforce those limits, which for all you listeners, means that the the invalidation is effective immediately. Well, so I'm sure that's that's a good news for some folks and maybe not for others. So it, beyond the aggregate limits at the federal level, does this change any other limits uh, for federal contributions? No, it really doesn't, and that's an important distinction to make. Um, a lot of people have called and asked exactly what does this mean? Does this mean that I can give more money to a candidate uh, that I've already maxed out to? And the answer is no. So the base limits, as the court calls them, are the ones that are still in effect. And the base limits would be the $2,600 per candidate per election limit that we have been operating under right along. What the court invalidated are the larger limits. So there is a two-year cycle limit, an aggregate limit, that basically says that you can't spend more than $123,000 and some change for all federal candidates federal political committees and federal political party committees combined. Um, and so what this basically means is that for some folks who have already been very generous with their contributions and have maxed out to at least nine different candidates, um, this means that they can continue to max out to additional candidates. And that's really something that the court took a hard look at in their opinion, and it was part of their underlying logic for their, their eventual conclusion. That's interesting. So essentially, a lot of the folks that were taking extraordinary steps to uh, contribute to the extent that they could and were creating elaborate spreadsheets may not have to do that anymore. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, I have seen quite a few of those spreadsheets myself. Um, and basically what it means is that now what you really have to worry about are those base limits. And that has actually been something that has been somewhat confusing for people who are wanting to make political contributions. Last cycle, for example, people might have given maxed out to more than nine candidates and ran afoul of the aggregate limits. Well, if you look, and for anybody who's ever looked at a solicitation or filled out a contributor form, at the bottom there's disclaimer language and it usually states you can give no more than $2,600 per election if it's a candidate, if it's a joint fundraising committee, you might have a whole page worth of disclaimers about how the, the money's going to be allocated. But nowhere in those disclaimers is anything, anything that actually explains to a potential contributor oh, you also have to worry about this other aggregate limit. And that's really what tripped some people up um, in the last election cycle. So now that concern, which a lot of people weren't weren't necessarily aware of anyway, has gone away. You know, it's very interesting that you say that because when you look at the FEC website, it doesn't do much to, you know, really help you understand it either. I know for the clients that I had that uh, tend to spend uh, on the higher end, uh, I created a, a an elaborate flow chart that helped them to more easily visualize how all of these limits applied. So, you know, for them, I'm sure that this is a, a, a double-edged sword and, you know, the, the contribution limits are gone, but that probably means more folks are going to be calling them, asking them for more money. Well, I've already heard that the fundraisers are busy dialing. <laughs> 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 you mean he was maxed out yesterday, but he's not maxed out today? <laughs> so uh, when we talk about the aggregate limits at the federal level, and because this is the Supreme Court, how does this impact uh, those, those handful of states that have aggregate contribution limits? Well, for some states, like Massachusetts, they actually issued a press release, and I'm forgetting if it was actually the day of the opinion, which would have been April 2nd, or if it was actually yesterday 
yesterday, April 3rd, um, but they actually issued a press release saying that they weren't going to enforce the aggregate limits anymore. It was the, the Massachusetts Campaign Finance Board. Um, for other states, I think they will probably wait for a for their legislature to actually repeal whatever statute is on the bo books. We had a similar situation with Citizens United in 2010, where Citizens United basically said that corporations can spend unlimited amounts on independent expenditures, and a lot of states had laws on the books that would have prohibited that activity. Now it took a while, you know, there were some states that were out in front and immediately issued a press release as Massachusetts has done, saying that they weren't going to enforce those provisions. However, other states decided that they were going to take a more targeted approach, um, potentially changing the law to repeal the invalidated provisions, but adding Dis more disclosure provisions, that sort of thing, um, as a way to still keep some idea and some transparency about what was going on in the process. So let's let's put this in context of if you are a corporation uh, or that has a, a PAC or it's a state where corporate contributions are permitted and we're subject to these aggregate limits and the state hasn't taken any action as of yet, is the company or even the individuals, are they permitted to go in now and, and make contributions and accept of those limits or are they still subject to the state laws until the law is changed or repealed? Well, I, th I think there is some risk um, in going ahead where the state hasn't necessarily indicated which way they are going with it. Um, but that being said, they can't enforce a law that the, the Supreme Court has said is unconstitutional. So an aggregate limit would be extremely problematic and I could see a lot of states, especially with the budgetary concerns, deciding that they weren't going to pursue those types of cases, even if the statutes had not been repealed. Do you think this ruling is going to open the door for corporations or, or other types of entities to make political contributions to candidates and committees at the federal level that they might have otherwise previously been prohibited from making? No, and, and really when the court wrote the opinion, or actually when, when Chief Just Justice Roberts wrote the opinion, um, it, he made it very clear that the underlying limits, the base limits, weren't at issue here. Um, and he didn't necessarily say that corporate contributions weren't at issue in this case, but that's part of it. The underlying restrictions and limits just weren't being questioned here. Nobody was saying, well, $2,600 per election somehow isn't constitutional. Um, and so from that standpoint, the court did not even contemplate whether or not direct corporate contributions to federal candidates we, would be permitted, but this case does nothing to change that existing restriction. So basically, uh, corporations still continue to be prohibited from making uh, corporate political contributions Correct. to candidates and committees. Correct. So th that, that, that leads to sort of the next question is, uh, the Federal Election Commission, you know, how do they determine or set the contribution limit sheet cycle? Well, by statute, the statute has basically set a base, which um, it was raised from $1,000 to $2,000 with the McCain-Feingold legislation. And every two years, that limit gets indexed for inflation. So what happens is in January, February, March of 2015, after this election, so the next election cycle, the Department of Labor will issue um, its regulations um, on inflation. And and that is what the FEC uses to determine how much the contribution should limit should be adjusted. But that won't happen until early next year. So we, as you mentioned, can assume there's going to be an increase in fundraising, but do you anticipate any particular type of activity that will significantly increase versus others? No, no. And and actually, over the last few, few days, what I've read and what I've been listening to, the debates that are going on about what this actually means for America and our democratic process, um, there have been several people that have said, well, there aren't, in actuality, eliminating the aggregate limits isn't going to make a huge difference. Um, I think the last election cycle that I heard a figure something like 646 people maxed out, hit their aggregate limits. 646 people compared to the entire United States, that's a fairly small amount. In fact, I would ha jokingly say that it's less than 1%, um, but you know, I don't, I don't know what the exact math is. So in actuality, I don't know that this is necessarily going to change um, the underlying activities. I think what it does do, though, is for some people who didn't necessarily understand why they had these aggregate limit caps, I think it, it removes that ambiguity. And while I can only support one 
political party committee um, to the max for two years straight instead of all three of a particular party that I might otherwise want to do, both the national committee, the congressional, and the senatorial. So I think it does away with that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, for, for the people that feel strongly and want to be involved through their, their political giving, I, th- I think that this gives them more freedom to do so. A lot less, a lot less complexity. Yes. Yeah. So it, then I guess the next question really becomes, so if the fundraising activity is going to, to increase and this aggregate limit goes away, do you think that this ruling will have some type of effect on how the super PACs operate or these so-called independent expenditure committees? Well, I hadn't given it any thought, but no, I don't believe it's going to change that because, again, we still have base limits in place, which mean that, you know, you can only give... 32800 to a national party committee, $2,600 per election to a candidate. Super PACs, on the other hand, uh, you can give unlimited amounts. And for people who really are driving the super PACs, um, they don't have the same restrictions as they would have if they were writing checks directly to the political parties or to candidates or even to PACs from that standpoint. So no, I, I, I don't necessarily see this impacting what super PACs do or who they get their money from. Does this impact, I know, again, we're talking about the lifting of the federal aggregate limit, but does it impact the limits that are imposed for pack-to-pack contributions or pack-to-committee or anything like that at the federal level? No, again, those base limits are still intact. So that was one of the first questions that I started getting from some of my corporate clients, which was, oh, does this mean that people can give more to our pack instead of the $5,000 per year? Does this mean that, you know, they can give more money, even in unlimited amounts? And the answer to that is no, unfortunately. Um, you know, the, the PAC limits, the PAC base limits, that $5,000 per year has been set in stone for a really long time, and that limit is not indexed for inflation. Um, so it seems somewhat unfair that candidates, you know, every two years they get a new limit and they can get more money in the door, but PACs are still subject to this $5,000 per person per year limit. Does this ruling affect uh, the review that's going on right now by the IRS with respect to 501c4 organizations or the the so-called welfare organizations? No, the C4 debate that the IRS is actually having right now, trying to determine and and provide some clarity with respect to whether or not what political activities a C4 can engage in is separate and apart from this ruling. Um, C4s don't have the same contribution limit restrictions. In fact, a lot of C4s that you can give unlimited amounts to a C4, um, either for its charitable purposes or even on the political side, really and truly the IRS discussion is, well, should these C4s actually be disclosing as political committees? At what point does the C4, instead of acting as a charitable organization, actually turn into a political committee and therefore required to register and report as such? Um, And that's really what the IRS debate is about right now. So the McCutcheon case won't touch that. So do these organizations, uh, similar to having the limitations on how actively they can be involved in lobbying, do they have similar limitations? I think I just heard you said they don't have them for political contributions. Well, they they can accept unlimited amounts of money. Now, how the C4 chooses to spend that money can actually impact the C4's tax-exempt status. So the IRS has always said, well, a C4's major purpose cannot be intervention in political campaigns, which would include political activities, independent expenditures, um, that sort of thing. Really, they're supposed to be a charitable organization. Um, And so from that standpoint, their major purpose can't be engaging or intervening in political campaigns and that's what the IRS is trying to wait through right now. Now if you're a C4 you are not legally required to publicly disclose your donors. You have to disclose them to the IRS but the IRS does not make that list public and a lot of the debate as I'm sure your listeners are familiar with has been well these C4s are doing these independent expenditures or running these ads and we have no idea there's no transparency into who's actually funding them Um, and that's really what the battle that's going on right now with the IRS. So when we talked earlier about the Supreme Court uh, opinion ruling these aggregate limits is unconstitutional and we've certainly heard uh, a lot of differing opinions pro for or against, uh, and, and, and the Congress has certainly not uh, held back on their opinions uh, that they've shared w- uh, with the public. 
what kind of action could Congress take to change the ruling? Uh, I mean, does does something like this, when it's considered unconstitutional, require them to actually amend the Constitution, or can they create a new law that would overrule what the Supreme Court has put out? Well, Congress has the ability to take into account what the court has said and the limits that it tries to set within its opinion. They can obviously go back to the books and they can say, okay, we're going to do campaign reform, campaign finance reform and take another look at this and take another crack at it, if you will. Um, what they could do, one of the things, is they could say, okay, well, we don't think that we like this opinion from the standpoint that it increases the amount of money in elections. So we're actually going to lower the, ex the base contribution limits. So they could say the contribution limits are no longer $2,600, they're $500, for example. Um, so they could do something like that. I don't necessarily know that there would be enough political momentum or willingness to do that, especially with campaigns costing more and more every cycle. Um, the idea that they would somehow cut <laughs> the amount of money that they could um, actually raise and spend in their campaigns, I don't, I don't see there being a lot of interest in doing something like that. Um, they could say, well, because of this it, and the idea that oh, um, the people with more expendable income are the ones that are going to be giving more and potentially driving elections more that a public financing system is necessary to try to counter that. Um, that's that's another area that they could take a look at. I mean, there are a lot of different things that they could do, but basically what, this, what the court has said is you can't do anything to put an overall limit on the amount of activity. And, and the court, as you know, past precedents has said, well, money is speech. And the court has basically said, you can't limit the total amount of speech that somebody wants to do. Um, you can't limit the total amount of money that they want to spend. You can limit how much they can give to any one person. And they've left that rationale intact, but they've done away with this idea that you can limit the overall. In fact, um, one, of the, one of the quotes from the opinion says that Congress may not regulate contributions simply to reduce the amount of money in politics or to restrict the political participation of some in order to, to enhance the relative influence of others. So this idea that Congress has the abil ability to level the playing field, it's something that um, folks in the, the campaign finance world are very familiar with that rationale. The court has basically said, no, we don't, we don't buy that anymore. We don't think that it's an appropriate use of Congress's power to do that, and it's it's basically unconstitutional because it places a restriction on somebody's First Amendment rights. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, I, I don't know what Congress could do, but I'm sure they'll come up with some very creative ideas. Lots of debate. <laughs> I'm sure that this is not the last we're going to hear about this particular <laughs> no. story. No. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, we want to remind everyone that if you have any questions that you would like us to review or uh, invite guests to talk about, to please visit us at www.politicalcompliancenews.com, and we'll be happy to entertain uh, your comments or questions. And once again, Melissa, Melissa Lorenza. A senior political law counsel with Aiken Gump, Strauss, Howard, and Feld, our special guest today. We hope you enjoyed this, and we'll be back to you with a new topic in our next edition. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Melissa. The preceding broadcast is shared for informational purposes only and should not be interpreted as legal counsel or advice. For more information on this or other broadcasts, please visit www.politicalcompliancenews.com.